Acting Executive Director of 3IE, Howard White. And what we try to do every year is find someone who embodies the passion and commitment and vision that Howard White has brought to our work. And in this case this year, we didn't have to go very far at all because Gonzalo has uh, also been a founder of 3IE and has been part of our wisdom and the guidance that we have benefited from and we have benefited, of course, from his vision and his experiences, which he has come today to share with all of you through his lecture. So without further ado, I want to introduce him quickly and then let him start uh, telling you his story. I love the title. Um, Gonzalo is the current executive, direct, uh, sorry, executive secretary of Mexico's National Evaluation Council and former board commissioner. Since 2005, he has led and coordinated the council's activities on measuring poverty and assessing social development programs. Prior to this, Gonzalo was the Director General for Evaluation and Monitoring in the Ministry of Social Development. He was also the Director of the School of Economics at the Mexico Autonomous Institute of Technology. <laughs> Gonzalo was the Academic Re Representative to the Commission for Labor Cooperation Agreement, and he was also one of the senior experts on the Monitoring Advisory Group for the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation. In 2016, the Secretary General of the United Nations appointed him as one of the 15 independent scientific experts in charge of drafting the 2019 Global Sustainable Development Report. Gonzalo, over to you, welcome. Thank you very much, Beryl. Thank you very much to 3AE, thank you very much to Manny, to Ruth, to all my colleagues, um, commissioners, of course, to the whole uh, 3AE team, and especially, thank you very much to you that you stay here after a very long day of learning and a lot of debate, so thank you very much for, uh, to you. Let me start by telling you what happened at home 10 years ago, approximately. Santiago, my son, was like eight. Darío was like six. And it was a thundery night. Lots of rain. The usual thunders in Mexico in the summer. And Santiago and Darío were really, really frightened, as it was the dog. And Darío asked my wife, Cristina, mommy, how do we know that the sun will rise tomorrow? <laughs> because I don't believe it's going to happen. I think we will keep this way with this darkness forever. So my wife gave them the explanation of why the, rise will, will, the sun will rise tomorrow, then the following day. And let me summarize this explanation. Of course, you know it, but let me put it in a summary. So she said, many, many years ago, the Earth, Mother Earth, had many children. Um, the main child was the moon. She was the most important child for the Earth. And then she had many other children, the stars. The name of the Earth is Coatlicue. In the Aztec language, the name of the moon is Koyolshauki, and the name of the stars are the Tsenson with Nawas. Tsenson means, means many in Nahuatl. So, they, it was many years ago. It was always dark, though, and always cold. And that's why the Mother Earth was sad in general. He wanted to have light and heat, because otherwise, she will be not able to have life within. No animals, no plants, no people. Therefore, she was craving for, for light. One day, she was sweeping the floor, and she found, coming from the sky, a bright feather. She put a feather in his chest, 
And because of that, she got pregnant. And during the pregnancy, during the pregnancy, she was very happy all along because she felt that the new child is going to bring her light and warm. However, the moon was not very happy. She was jealous. She won't be the most favorite child anymore. So the moon and her sisters decided to kill the earth. They were approaching the full moon and the stars approaching to kill the earth. And at that very moment, the child was born. And it was a strong and bright child. It was a son. It was the son, whose name was Huichilopostli. And he was born with a fire sword. And with that sword, he cut into pieces the moon and made the stars go away. And therefore, the only one remain were the sun and the earth. And that is why, my son, every day the sun will rise to protect the mother. Every time there will be darkness and the, and the moon and the stars will threaten the earth, the sun will rise. So my, my, my two sons eventually went to sleep. They were, they were better off. They were soothed. There's just one little, small, tiny problem with this. That explanation, it's not true. <laughs> according, because according to strong evidence and rigorous evidence, apparently the explanation is quite different. <laughs> um, however, the purpose of that night is for my wife to convince my children about a certain issue. She was trying to convince some stakeholders about some elements. She was trying to sue them. She was trying to comfort them. It was not about an astronomy class. My wife was doing what she was doing politics. She was convincing stakeholders, and she did. In fact, what, what had happened in the history of humankind is that we are full of those stories. We are full of, of myths. We are full of stories when we try to explain things, or we try to be calm about stuff. The problem we all have here is that we really believe in facts and we really believe in evidence. We struggle every day here in trying to produce evidence, rigorous evidence, in showing governments and the citizens the problems we have to solve them. So we have a big, big challenge because unlike stories and myths, reality and facts sometimes hurt. It's not that easy to find out sometimes what we face. And therefore, reality is important, of course. Evidence is important, of course. But sometimes it's not easy to, to get it. It's not, it's not easy to, to buy it. If I approach the scales in the next week, after my scones of this, this week, I don't want to face my, the scales. I don't want to face my, my weight. I don't want to face what you're going to evaluate me after this. I will feel much better saying, well, this is, it was all right, isn't it? It was great, isn't it? Um, therefore, the element here of this talk is how can we evaluators, how can we evidence producers, how can we, the people who really believe in evidence, how can we beat the other guys? Because in this 21st century, what we have is many stories more harmful than the ones on the moon. It's about people believing, many people still believe, that vaccines are not important. That vaccines 
are there because of these greedy pharmaceuticals who are selling us stuff that we don't need. And that's a nice story for many. How can we beat those stories? How can we beat, let's make America great again? <laughs> that story is very appealing to many for various reasons. Of course, one reason is, in fact, many people were left behind in America uh, over the past years. We have to solve those problems, but how can we produce stories who appeal to, the other, to, 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 to people? How can we beat those stories? So my, my, my so the proposal here is, and which I think is quite evident, when we're trying to produce evidence and convince many people, is which is the narrative? Which is the story? Which are the politics we should be making? Uh, Howard, in, in the morning, very wisely said, we need the fourth revolution of, uh, of evidence, meaning we need results um, brokers. He's right. I may say, perhaps we need a fifth one. Or the first one is, we need storytellers. People to convince the others. Because if we don't do that, we will be beaten as in some times we have beaten here. So, there are two reasons why making stories is important. One, as I said, we feel comfortable with stories. We feel we feel calm. And the second one is that apparently, if we don't make them, it will be very difficult for, for us to convince many people. So I can say, well, I can convince you, I can convince Ruth, I can convince Richard, uh, Miguel can convince me, I can convince you of producing perhaps one, two, three, four, five impact evaluations. We can perhaps convince one government to produce one impact evaluation, that's fine. But what we like here is to have an ongoing evaluation system to go farther than one impact evaluation. We need governments and citizens to use evidence in an everyday basis. If we want to do that, we have to go beyond convince, convincing the people who are already convinced. We have to make stories. We have to be able to convince people of these types of tables. At this very moment, apparently, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say the name of the, of the country, but apparently, <laughs> apparently, uh, the new government of that country, <laughs> it's about to dismantle a very important social program in that country. Um, and perhaps they will be doing that without enough evidence. And this program has been there for 20 years. And many of us have been working on that program in, in Mexico. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, it's always the mind, you know, it's, I didn't want to say Mexico because, it's, so I don't I won't say Mexico anymore. Um, but apparently, with a lack of, um, of evidence, they may be changing it. And some weeks ago, we had some opportunity to talk to these guys, the new guys. And in some of the sessions, we had these tables, which are very important tables. This is the thing we do every day. We have to make and produce these tables in a very efficient way and in a very um, formal way and in a very rigorous way. If we don't produce these tables, then our story of evidence doesn't work. However, <laughs> If we're trying to convince a government, which 
their stories, everything done in the past is wrong. Everything in the past is corrupt. It will be very difficult to compete trying to show that this was done through, through uh, regression discontinuity stuff. So imagine someone said, well, this is regression discontinuity. It was very well done. The R square is like, like 80. And these guys went, what? What is the story here? So apparently, apparently, if we want to go beyond the usual suspects, we have to make stories. So apparently, every time we see as an institution, a society, which goes beyond 150 people, according to you, Van Noah Harari, which Ian and I like very much. If we have a, a society, an institution which goes ma many years, 10 years, 12 years with many people, it means that there is a story which was told there. It means that we are making a story in which we connect with many people, even if those people are not really aware of impact evaluation. We have so many examples of the stories where the main objective was to collectively cooperate in large numbers. So let me give you some examples. So this is for Ho Chi Minh. This is the body of Ho Chi Minh, which is on display in Hanoi. So I went there uh, to, to Hanoi, and I wanted to see Ho Chi Minh. I, I like to see all this stuff myself. I don't know why. <laughs> there was a queue of 45 minutes waiting to see Ho Chi Minh. And when I got there, in front of me was a Vietnamese girl of 18, 19 years old. And when we were in front of Ho Chi Minh, she was crying. She was really deeply moved by Ho Chi Minh, a guy who died 40 years ago. But that is a very nice story of a united nation, Vietnam, under very important rule Ho Chi Minh. And the same happened to Mao. This is Mao here. You can, you can see Mao with the body in, in Beijing. And, and it's a very important symbol. Even in Mexico, <laughs> there was a very important general. He was a president. And in a battle, he lost um, a hand. Believe it or not, the people kept the hand. And it was on display for 40 years. And governments were doing some res paying respects every year to, ha to the hand of Álvaro Obregón, a symbol of a country a story that goes beyond important facts. And then we have this important uh, um, uh, element like zero hunger. It was an extraordinary story for Lula on his first uh, election uh, campaign. He, he united Brazil, rich and poor, on one important element. And the one dollar a day is also important. And the, Let's make America great again is also important. How can we beat this stuff? So, in general, a good narrative has these elements. A main idea, let's produce impact evaluation. So Ruth convinced me, Miguel convinced me, I convinced some of them. This is initially, there is, the apostles are there. But then you need magic. You need to see, you know, um, I need to give you hope for the future. And there, there's the writing, if possible. So there goes this jo Joseph Smith saying, I had a vision. And I can write my vision here. Because the angel told me that there are some things buried in New York State. So Followers from Jesus went up to New York State and buried some, something, and he was discovered there. And he was writing. Oh, really? Yes, yes, it was. That happened, yes, actually. Oh, so these are the followers of Jesus. And, and who's this Jesus? Well, this was a very important guy. He was born from a virgin. Really? 
Yeah. Really? Yeah, there was one. He did, he did very good things. He died. Uh, he resurrected. And he went to heaven. Really? Yes, he did. So we cannot see him. No, no, he's in the heaven. No? And where are the, the things that, that were buried in New York? We cannot see them. But please believe on that. We believe on that. Many people believe on that beyond very small numbers of people. And then we need to have some people on the hook from time to time. Otherwise, people just leave, <laughs> leave that society. So God is good. God wants the best for you. Great. So why is it that my brother died on cancer? Well, I mean, he's better off. He's better off. And you will be better off in the future. Believe on that. So let's see. Let's see how many of these elements of the stories, of important stories, are in the Mexican monitoring and evaluation system, beyond the technical parts. What elements are here? Uh, let me show you one important element, Progresa. Progresa was the first impact evaluation in, in I think, I guess in Latin America. It was very well produced. Um, some of you were involved in, in, in that very important evaluation. Uh, it was a matter of convincing some people, some guys in Washington, some guys in Mexico, some, some guys in the Ministry of Finance, and it was done. It wasn't easy, but it was done. The good part about this evaluation is that it showed good results on the program. And that element was very important for the, bu for the building block which was next, next. So the evaluation was very good. And then, as a demonstration effect, some other programs wanted to have impact evaluations. So Miguel remembers very well the milk program in Mexico, who wanted to have a similar evaluation done independently to show the good results of the milk program. And we did it. And it was a whole great um, uh, event, Miguel. Where we, where we show the very good results of the milk program. So this is a story where you have, I give you this device, and this device can help your program to survive and to get more budget. I want to buy that. What would have happened if the results of Progresa were bad? What is the story there? You know, I have this device, and I can show you with this device that, the pro that your program doesn't work. Oh, thank you, I don't want to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> a bigger story, a bigger story. For the first time in 1997, for the first time in Mexico, there was a balance of power between Congress and the president. For the first time, the party in Congress, the majority, was from a different color from the president. For the very first time in Mexico in many years, Congress started asking for government, from the president, from the executive, accountability and proper measurement and proper elections. So therefore, the story is the president lies a lot. The president, we don't trust him. Let's measure property. Let's measure prop, uh, uh, properly their programs. Therefore, the collective idea in Congress and civil society was, let's have an independent way of measuring things. Let's have independent institutions. Corneval was created here. Corneval was created in around uh, 2005 with the purpose of measuring poverty and producing evaluations in an independent way because we don't believe executive. Was that, what, was that story correct? In part it was. In part it wasn't, because the president wasn't lying all the time, all the day, every day. He lied sometimes. <laughs> well, that's enough to make a story. That's enough 
to convince 500 Congress people and 125 senators to write a law who says we need in the independent way of measuring poverty and producing evaluation. There was some writing there. Even most of the Congress people haven't heard about evaluation in their lives. They didn't hear about impact evaluation. They haven't heard about poverty measurement. Therefore, the story went beyond some few apostles. That's a big story. And therefore, that happened, it's written, and it's the creation of Coneval and the start of evaluations in a massive way in 2001. And because of that, together with the Ministry of, My of Finance, we, we are able now to show you this monitoring and evaluation system, which has many important elements. It has, oh, well, yeah. um, it has the indicators for programs, results indicators. We have an evaluation plan. We have the follow-up of recommendations. And this is today an ongoing system. As we speak, we are producing evaluations for almost 150 programs every year. As we speak, we are producing results indicator for those programs. As we speak, we are having different types of evaluations. And, and this very day, the morning, this is now the morning in Mexico, the new finance minister is using these evaluations to produce next year's budget, as we speak, in an ongoing way. So all this magic produce these elements together, of course, with relatively good technical stuff. And at the same time, we are producing this part on the top, which is our multidimensional poverty indicator, which was mandated by Congress as well. Those elements are an ongoing way of producing things. And we have produced 2,500 evaluations over the past almost 11 years. We have if evaluations for the budget process. We have information of almost 6,500 programs in the whole country. This is an, an inventory of programs. We have an evaluation report every two years. Uh, we release these poverty figures every two years. And here it comes another magical moment. We didn't see that 10 years ago. But for the past five years, for the past six years, something happened, which is the following. Governors and the president and the ministers, they understand that the poverty indicator is, about, is a very powerful indicator in terms of the media and in terms of their political incentives. No governor, no president would like to pov poverty to increase. However, unlike in the past, they cannot change this indicator according to their mandate. They cannot do that. It's an independent way of measuring poverty. The only way to, re to reduce poverty in Chiapas, in Tabasco, in Mexico City, in Nuevo Leon, in the whole country is through public policy. Unlock, of course. Therefore, it has been amazing that instead over the past five, six years, instead of us knocking at the doors of, 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 go, of uh, police, politicians, say, well, uh, excuse me, I'm, we are here from Carnival, and I, we have all these evaluations showing which programs are working and which programs are not working that well. Instead of doing that, we have governors and ministers knocking at Carnival's doors, say, well, uh, can you explain us what is exactly the way you measure poverty? And which are the most important programs that can make poverty reduce in all dimensions? 
if you look that carefully, that story is about linking evidence to the incentives of politicians and policy makers. Someone said before, Horacio said, uh, which is right, uh, or someone else said before, um, our friend from, from Libya, perhaps, I don't know. Um, yes, politicians care about people, yes, but they care more about their next appointment. They want to be the next president, or the next governor, or the next minister. So if you tell them, hey, I have a device which can help you with your, with your future. If poverty goes down, then you will have another good points in the future. You are linking evidence to those political incentives. Every time, every time, we can link evidence to the incentives of politicians, they can listen better. All the time. Yes, of course, we, can, we, we should convince them that poverty, reduction of poverty is important because of the world and blah, that's right. Yes, but if, you, if we sell them with this case, that's, that's much better. And in fact, over the past six years, um, poverty, at least extreme poverty, has been reduced um, uh, in, a, in a greater pace than, than in the past. And it, it has, has to do, in part, not everything, of course, due to this effort of governments, federal, and some governments in the state, to put money on those programs who reduce poverty according to various dimensions. So the story is an interesting one from my point of view. And I believe, I believe that if we search with these eyes other institutions where many people are involved and when they, and, and when they stay long in the market, you can find similar stories. 3IE is another good story. I mean, imagine what would happen if it was only about convincing the already people convinced. Imagine Ruth going around saying, well, why don't we do this? Yes, let's do that. But when we had, when Ruth and others, Miguel and others, uh, Bill Salvador and others, had this magic of saying, well, when will we ever learn? When will we ever learn? How can we re narrow the evaluation gap? That made a click. I still use that phrase. Let's narrow the evaluation gap. And from, from those days of 2003, 2005, we had 3IE. And we had a very strong institution. We are celebrating their 10 years of, of, of 3IE with great success, as we just heard. And we survived even the first board member meeting. In part, I was there. I was there. <laughs> I've told you that before because Marie, she was there as well. Uh, on the first board meeting, during the first hour of the meeting, we lost one board member. <laughs> she, she left. She left, didn't she? she Say, well, I, I don't have anything to do here. Let go. And in the next, in the following, in the, in the following hour, there were arguments between. Um, commissioners that the rooms were really, were really small and the hotel rooms were really small. Last dinner was horrible. This guy is not treating us well. So I thought, well, this, this is it, you know? Three uh, IE would last one day. <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky that I'm here in Paris for once. Well, it was all right. But, but many things happened, unfortunately, and now and then Howard was very, uh, very wise. Marie and others were very wise. Uh, commissioners were wiser then. <laughs> then Richard arrived, and uh, it was um, very good. Um, Ruth arrived, and we are on the way. Let me 
ask you to, to give a big applause to Terry. Manny, Manny has done an excellent job. Howard did it. All the team has done. Uh, I was there. I was there for 10 years. And I'm stepping down as commissioner. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy because I learned a lot. I'm sad because I'm, I'm leaving a wonderful team. Um, I've been in Coneval for 12 years. Uh, eventually, I have to leave. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's been a wonderful time. And I think one of the most important things that I learned is that building a monitoring and evaluation system, it's a political challenge with technical elements, not the other way around. Therefore, if we don't apply politics to the things what we do, then we will convince very few people not enough people, at least. And we have challenges. We have new challenges. Let me give you one from uh, Conneval and the other for 3AE. Unlike 12 years ago in Mexico, now we have a strong president who won the presidency with 53% of the votes. He has the majority as well in Congress, and he's a very powerful man. Unlike what happened in 1997 with a divided, a divided uh, power. Now he has, and his party, all the power. Therefore, the story that started the whole thing saying, well, we need to control the president from Congress, that story doesn't apply anymore. We need another story. We need another narrative. We have to apply it in the next few months. And some, there are, here are some suggestions. Instead of saying, yes, let's, let's measure this president properly so he can tell, he can do. No, his, the, other, the other possibility is let's help the president to have better results in the short and medium term. It will be very important for Mexico and for him, with all the expectations he raised, to have results. And I give you this device. It's called evaluation. If we can evaluate properly and on time your programs, in the next year, in the next two years, then it will be more likely for you, President, to have better results. That's another narrative. That's different. And let's not only produce impact evaluation, which takes two, two years, three years. Let's, al let's also have the implementation stuff. Let's help you with, with the things on implementation, because with that, we'll have better results in the short run. So this is the type of narratives that we need in Mexico. 3IE is different be uh, between now and 10 years ago. Now we have more players in the field more institutions producing impact evaluation. Now, the countries need more tools than impact evaluations. And the donors say, well, we were happy 10 years ago. Uh, what else do you have? Therefore, the narrative must change. And has been changing, by the way. It's how can we, through IE, help developing countries to produce the evidence they need, always with a foot on impact evaluation. Not, let's not forget about that, but let's help them with other stuff. Where, where is our new niche? So we have to produce new narratives. And we need a hero. <laughs> <laughs>